welcome. Thank you for coming. Deborah and I love doing these uh, workshops together. We started doing, this is our, what, third or fourth one, and um, we're just going to keep rolling them out. If you guys like them, just let us know. And if you have any ideas, there's a, isn't there a suggestion box up there? Customer service. So if there's any other topics or anything you're interested in, even the movies. I'm the one that goes through and picks out the movies. We have uh, certain movies every month. So if there's something you guys think that might be relevant that we could air that here too. I appreciate it. So I'm Laurel Sterling, the registered dietitian here. Um, I do counseling, which is a free service of the store, as well as lectures like this and the, the movie nights and lecturing out in the community as well. And this is Deborah, and she is in charge of the uh, Time Out Cafe out there, which has got a slew of wonderful things and new things coming. So she just keeps adding wonderful things to it. So, um, and how I keep these is very informal. Well, what we're going to do for the first part is I'm going to talk a little bit about the history and the whys and the nutritional values of, um, and then we're going to go into Deborah's, which is dealing with demoing and talking about um, the different recipes. And she's the one that actually does more of it than I. I have, I'm have. i just kind of tiptoeing my way into it. I bought the sprouting jar and I haven't actually done it yet. So um, that's what she's going to do is to go, yeah, going over it. So and if you guys have anything, if you've done it for a while, you can comment into it as well um, because we're always learning from you guys as well as, you know, um, learning from us. So I'm going to start and I'm just going to have you click the one button there and see. Is that okay for the lights or did you want it all out? That's okay. Everyone can hear. What's that? Oh, okay. Good. Okay. So everybody can hear me. Okay. All right. All right. So I will get started. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the fermentation process. Now, this isn't something that's new. This has been around, as as you'll see, um, it says 6,000 years BC uh, for preservation, and so. Um, it was born because of the preservation mode, and most of the research, when you look at it, goes to more of the dairy base. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about um, Eli Menshnikov and, and some of the studies, not really studies, but what he looked at in the early 1900s. So as I said, nearly every civilization since 6000 BC has included at least one fermentable food in their heritage, and these are just some of them. Some of these, I have no idea what uh, you know they are really, <laughs> but um, I know with the Indian chutneys, and um, has anybody had any of these other than the ones we know of, sauerkraut, yogurt, kefir? Yes, and this is actually one of the, did you want to hand these out after? or? Okay, we have recipes, and that actually is um, one of the recipes that Deborah's done. So um, Japanese natto, I saw a picture of that. It's the fermented soy. You can actually see the soybeans, and it's this long, goopy, stringy, Stuff. And I, I just know that people have said it just doesn't taste all that great. So, um, so there's, this again has been around for a long time. Actually, uh, I found a lot of great, interesting points about um, what different cultures use. In West Africa, they use this stuff called gari, which is an important source from the cassava root, um, the cassava root, and it actually contains natural cyanides in there. So if it's not properly fermented, it can be poisonous. And um, a Tanzanian fermentable gruel has been found to protect against foodborne illnesses in regions that have poor sanitation. So, again, they have their own practices for certain reasons. Now, what I really know is one of the things that kicked off um, some of the stuff that we talk about when I lecture on probiotics is um, Eli Menshikov in uh, Bulgaria. What he did was he started looking at communities that were not the nobles, they were the, the lesser, the, the, what would you call them, the peasant class, thank you, yeah. Yeah, and they actually um, were living longer and healthier than the uh, nobles were. And he wondered why that was, and he saw that they were eating a lot of the, the cultured kefirs and whatnot in their diet. So that was sort of the beginnings of the scientific looking at of why and how these are beneficial for us. Um, Minoru Shiroda also is a Japanese physician back in the 30s, and he hypothesized that the right mix of the gastrointestinal bacteria could prevent disease. So again, these are earlier thinking 
Um, now, as far as looking at studies here, we have kimchi, which was perfect for us to have here as a recipe. But in 2011, um, in the issues of the International Journal of Food Microbiology and also in the Journal of Applied Microbiology, found that kimchi may protect against certain cancers, modulating the immune system, protecting against foodborne pathogens, and also lowering cholesterol, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, so, basically, the home practice was the home fermentation, the lactic acid fermentation, which is also called lacto-fermentation. It's one of the most common methods and the easiest to experiment with at home. And this is an anaerobic process. So the lactic acid bacteria, mainly from like the lactobacillus, which is your probiotic um, species, converts the sugar, in this case I just wrote down, because I was using yogurt as an example, the lactose sugar, into lactic acid, giving it that sour taste instead of sweet taste, which acts then as a preservative. And then also along with the salt has been traditionally used, it, this creates conditions that are favorable to bacteria as well, and it prevents the growth of pathogenic microorganisms that pulls water and nutrients from the substrate and, and also adds flavor. And this has been, again, these were known for thousands of years. There's a lot of other fermentable foods other than the cabbage, kimchi, you can do carrots. We used to carry, and I didn't check in the cooler, do we still have the packets where we had um, fermented carrots and... Um, Okay, yeah, we used to carry those in packets. I know people would come in a lot for those. Um, so you could try to do it on your own as well. Uh, so garlic, soybeans, that's like I said, the, the natto, olives, cucumbers, your pickles, onions, turnips, radishes, cauliflower, peppers, lemons, and berries as well. Now, when you're looking at the science of the probiotics, which this is where they're seeing the studies looking back on why these fermentable foods actually have a benefit, this is where they start looking at the dairy-based products and saying, oh, this is what's within it, that this is helping out in the body. So these evidence-based reviews indicate that certain strains of probiotics, because let me just back up on this for, for a minute. Um, most of you know, when you think of probiotics, what do you think of? What's one of the first things as far as um, anything that pops in your head when you think of probiotics? Yogurt. Anything else? Balancing the intestines. Anybody? pH? Yep. Well, not a lot of people know that we actually have over 400 different types of strains of bacteria in our gut. And in the upper intestine, that is called the uh, lactobacillus family. And in the lower, it's the bifido family. And there actually was a very prominent study. It was a Japanese study that found that when, when I think, I don't know why they picked age 50, but they looked at, at 50 years old when the natural flora in the colon started to drop off, that the, the um, putrogenic bacteria that comes in from soils and foods and everything else and, um, that we're exposed to, increased and went on the rise, and right along with that, colon cancer went right on the rise. Um, and so they were correlating that as a strong um, indicator. So 50 years plus, you want to make sure that you have a good amount of bifido bacteria. And when you look at the yogurts, there may be one or two strains. Um, the Greek yogurts have, I think, a few more strains in there and less sugars. But a lot of this science goes back to, like I was telling you, Eli Menchikoff back in right around the... 1900 mark when they started looking at the, the cultured kefir and saying, okay, why is there this benefit? And the science of probiotics is relatively in the past at least 20 to are starting to look at okay, what, what all these different bugs do. And that's why when you look at our shelves out there, we have so many different ones that do so many different things. Because they've actually seen, like if you see Lactobacillus acidophilus, which is one of the 400 strains, most people think of, when I say probiotic, they say, oh, acidophilus. Well, that's one strain of the 400. And if it has a number after it, that means that it actually was researched, and they found out, okay, this one strain was good for preventing colic, for um, helping with the immune system, for helping with diarrhea and irritable bowel and colitis or something like that. 
And so each one would be documented in the studies that they found. So that's why we have all these different formulations out there for certain ages, because then now they're finding for infants, they need to have a certain amount of bifido, and then for a while in between, you don't need to have a lot, and then after age 50, you really need to get that bifido back in there. Um, in the um, in the upper intestines, the lower intestines, for someone with Crohn's, with someone with a vaginal infection, they found all different strains that work in the different places in the body. So, um, further research, and I apologize, I didn't put this in the right order with my um, with my uh, journals, uh, the journals in there. I lumped them together. But the ro it, the further research on the lactobacillus has a role as an inhibitor of the cell mutation supported by research in the Journal of American um, of medical food, and the next one, the 2001 study in the American Clinical Journal of Clinical Nutrition, that should be down with the next. It found that daily intake of fermented vegetables over several weeks resulted in decreased levels of cancer-promoting inflammatory markers that they found in the stool. So they're seeing the benefits, you know, and seeing the research actually in the foods as well, which is phenomenal. Again, that's where it started, but the research really wasn't there until then they started looking at the probiotics, which is what is in all of these cultured foods. So probiotics, again, is I, they're used as therapy. As I said, some of I've mentioned, diarrhea, gastroenteritis, um, people that have uh, H. pylori, which is an overgrowth of bacteria in the stomach. They use an acid blocker as well as probiotics, a certain one called um, lactobacillus GG, which out there is the culturel as well as roideri to help eradicate it. Um, irritable bowel, typically with people with irritable bowel or inflammatory bowel diseases like Crohn's and colitis, I use certain strains that are more in the uh, lower, in the colon. And cancer, again, that would just be, um, in general, some upper and lower intestine ones. Other benefits of the probiotics? Um, lactobacillus and other bacteria may protect against foodborne illnesses by inhibiting and eradicating the pathogens um, of a few of these, like Listeria, um, Staphylococcus, and Bacillus cereus. Now, what these do actually is, once these good bacteria get in there, because we have about 80% beneficial bacteria in the gut, 20% non, um, and then there's other fungals that are laying dormant, and if we keep it in this nice mix, then everything's kind of kept in check. But if you've taken a lot of antibiotics, if you've taken um, a lot of steroids, other things like chlorinated, fluoridated water, things that will kill off the bacteria, it disrupts uh, the, the nice um, balance that, that actually is in there. And so the putrogenic bacteria, the non-beneficial ones, and also those fungals that were kept in check are no, no longer kept in check, and they start to grow and cause all sorts of issues. Now, when you add in this good bacteria, what they do is there's all these receptors along the gut lining, and these kind of fit in as sort of a lock and key, and they have these shields sort of over this. So they can, there might be like three receptors, and the shields are covering it. So it doesn't allow these um, non-beneficial bacteria to then take hold and start doing some damage because they can't get to those sites. Also, once the good ones get in there, they lower the, um, they, they get more of a little bit of an acidic environment. That's why they're called lacto, or lactic acid bacteria, is because they create a little bit more of an acidity in there so that those putrogenic bacteria can't flourish in that environment. As well as, a third thing, once the others have gotten in there, taken hold, lowered the, and made the more acidity in there, covered up some of the sites. Then on top of that, because they're able to now eat more of the food and flourish where the others just die. So there's things that take away from the others to not allow them to continue to grow. So they've actually seen in, for instance, L. reuteri, which is a um, lactobacillus reuteri, that once you've taken this over at least a month, when that starts to get into the body and take hold, that it didn't allow anybody that was exposed to these foodborne pathogens, it couldn't take hold into the body. So it was pretty interesting stuff. Um, so that's why they say to take this on a continual basis. And what you want to do is, you know, get a good combination of things. Eat your cultured foods as well as take a probiotic. And you always want to switch around the probiotics. You don't want to take... Just, I've had people taking lactobacillus acidophilus for years, 
and that's just the one strain out of 400. You need so many more, so you want to vary it all the time. Um, so I love my cows. I grew up on a farm, so I just just love the pictures of cows. Um, so the traditional lacto-fermentation uses the microflora that's present naturally in the vegetables and the um, lactic acid bacteria starter, which is usually a whey or a dairy base. Now, the large-scale manufacturing, they really strip things. The vegetables are washed in diluted chlorine um, solutions, and it destroys that bacteria naturally um, instead of using lactic acid or whatnot. And most pickles are pasteurized and create more of a sterile product, and they're desalted and rinsed, and they remove the beneficial bacteria. So, um, you know, you are getting what you're getting from, from a commercial large manufacturing. In small small batches, if you are doing this, this is now becoming more of the wave of the future. And again, if you don't want to do it yourself, which it's easier to start on some of the things that, that um, Deborah's going to show you, to sort of tiptoe your way into it. That's what I have to do is sort of work my way into it slowly. But um, if, you, if you don't want to do something like that, you can just start by buying some things and then slowly working it in, in other ways. Um, this was just something I came across which was interesting. If, you know, you're living in Alaska and you are having a lot of the fish heads and walrus and sea lion and whatnot, they were finding that um, the, uh, the CDC found that this state had the highest amount of botulism since 1985. It was when they were actually having these, like, beaver tails and, and whatnot sitting out for extended periods of time um, before being consumed. Um, in using them in containers instead of the traditional grass lined hole, they're putting them in these airtight, so it's creating more of this bacteria to grow. So um, you don't want to do that if you're eating your beaver tail. <laughs> I thought it was kind of funny, so I just put that in there. Um, so also, I have this in a lot of my presentations, so I apologize if you see it over and over. But why you want to choose organic when you're fermenting? Just like anything, when I was talking about raw or when I was talking about juicing you are um, getting all of those uh, extra pesticides and whatnot, and you're concentrating them too, especially when you're juicing, you're concentrating them. So you really want to make sure that you're getting um, more organic on certain fruits and vegetables. So 80% of the pesticides are carcinogenic. Um, the average American consumes one gallon of pesticides annually. And Mount Sinai study in 2003 showed that when a large group of individuals were tested for 200 pesticide residues, 90 different pesticides showed up in humans. That's actually increased no, now. There's a study that I saw back in uh, the fall of 2012 when they took the cord uh, blood and tested it from newborns, and they found over 200 different chemicals residing in the cord blood alone. So, you know, nobody's being born without a significant amount of chemicals. And it's because of what it is, is in our body, it's stored in the fat cells, and it's then transmitted from whatever the mother has into the, the child. Um, so there's the dirty dozen list of foods that should be avoided unless they're organic. And the dirty dozen are high pesticide residue foods, according to the e um, Environmental Working Group. And these were tested even after being washed. So I constantly have people saying, well, can I just wash them? Can I just wash them? Can I wash them? What do you think? It's sprayed throughout the entire growing process. So it's just, it's going to seep right in there. They actually saw um, with uh, um, apples, and I didn't put this in, in here, uh, but they were looking at why there were more allergies coming about. And they tested some apples, organic and ones that were just traditional that were sprayed. And these are one of the highly uh, sprayed fruits out there. And so they saw that the ones that were exposed to that spray had a lot more of this allergen. It was to protect itself. And then within us, it created a lot more allergies. So they're now seeing that, you know, it's not just, yeah, these are carcinogenic, they're actually creating more of an allergy response in us. So eating these foods exposes an individual to 15 pesticides a day. So these foods right here are the ones that should be completely organic. And it may have changed since then. Um, some, some, I think, have changed on the chart. But if you go to the e environmental work, ewg.org, and that would give you the, um, the dirty dozen, as well as the clean 15, which I'll show you in a sec. 
Yes. Did they? Summer squash. That's crazy. Yeah. I I think that's actually. Let me go to the next. That's on the Queen 15, actually. Um. So the environmental working group's research shows that people who eat five fruits and vegetables a day from the dirty dozen consume an average of 10 pesticides a day. And so we're supposed to increase our fruit and vegetables, right? We're not getting enough, not getting enough, not getting enough. And then within that, I had a woman actually the other day, yesterday, I, I go into my daughter's school and I volunteer and then I eat with lunch with her. And I had this huge strawberry. I couldn't believe it was so huge. And it was organic, but it was gargantuan. <laughs> And she just pulled it out and showed her friends, look how big this is. And they were going, oh, ooh, wow, you know. And then the, the, the um, what are they called, the lunch aides were walking around. And she said, oh. And I had another um, one of those glass filled of, of um, straw or raspberries and blueberries. And she said, wow, those berries look delicious. I said, yeah, they are. And she said, I just can't get myself to buy them. The price of them is still too high. And I thought, what? And she said, I know, that's kind of great. I said, I, I don't care. I mean, my food bill is really high compared to probably the norm because I will put it into that versus into going to all these doctor's visits and whatnot. So I just don't get that mentality. Um, the Clean 15, eating these foods can even reduce exposure to pesticides by 90% by exposing you to only two pesticides a day. So these are the ones that... Um, should be okay not having to get organic. Um, and why did I put this in there? Just, oh, okay. So as far as detoxification, it's very, very, very important. We're, again, we're exposed to so many chemicals all the time. They're putting out more and more and more in the environment. And we're having to de detoxify these all the time on top of the ones that we're eating and we're putting on our skin. Um, so it's really important to keep that liver functioning as efficient as possible because we're being exposed to so much. And also, the liver is one of the places that actually these toxins are lodged in there as a protectant to the body. So we want to keep that properly detoxifying. So um, this basically just shows you how, how it works. Um, a toxin can come in. These enzymes try to work upon it to, to break things apart. And once it's broken apart, it's trying to make it more water-soluble. Well, it has to go through this second phase to actually attach some things to make it more water-soluble to excrete out. If it doesn't go through these two processes and it creates more of that intermediate compound, that's more volatile than that actual toxin coming in. So we need to make sure that the body's appropriately doing the phase one, phase two. And how do you get that? Um, the cruciferous vegetables actually increase phase one and phase two. So your broccoli, cabbage, um, bok choy, arugula, cauliflower, kale, Brussels sprouts. Um, also, the limonene-containing foods, fruits, like the oranges, tangerines, lemon, not so much the grapefruit. That actually would interfere with some medications. It's uh, it, uh, speeding through medications too quickly. So you have to be careful with those. Also, um, curcumin found in turmeric, rosemary, egg yolks, onions and garlic, and beets. And there's more, too, but these are also the main ones. Yes? Yeah. No, just all throughout. That would be great, yeah. Yep, all throughout. That would just help continue. I actually had a woman who came in to see me, and, and as she was talking about her, and we must have talked about beets somehow because it brought up talking about her aunt who was given, I don't know, she, they were told that she had some issue with her liver and they said she didn't have much time to live and she just started consuming a gargantuan amount of beets and she actually helped heal her liver and she lived for another 20, 25 years. So, um, and I grew up with pickled beets. My family loved, my dad loved pickled. <coughs> and that is the one thing to this day I really have a hard time because... I actually couldn't leave the table. There was one time I could not leave the table because I would not eat those pickled beets because I couldn't stand anything pickled. I don't like pickles. I don't like the pickling. So I, I, have, I have started to um, acquire that taste with the vinegar, but my mom growing up used to wash her hair in vinegar and clean the house with vinegar, 
and I just, ah, the smell of it was just a bad thought for me. But I've changed, you know, she still does, and I just laugh about it now. But I, I actually can have the stuff now, but um, I still will not have pickled beets. I will have beets by themselves. They're sweet. I, I never knew that they were sweet because I always ate them pickled. So, um, you know, just some of the things that we grow up with. Okay, so now with sprouting. Um, all vegetables, nuts and seeds, beans and grains begin life as sprouts. In every seed there is a protective shell and starch for the nourishment. And then when you add the water and the warmth, the hard shell can become soft and it starts to swell and burst and then there's your beautiful sprout. Um, some sprouting history, 5,000 years old or more. Um, in 2939 BC, the Emperor of China wrote about the versatile qualities of sprouts. So um, it's been around. Why sprout? It's easy, fast, um, the cost is very inexpensive. Dry, the nutrients are locked away, but when you um, actually start to sprout them, it, it increases the value. And for example, when you're looking at cooked soybeans, they can cause gas, but not so when you sprout for a couple of days and you cook it for another 20 minutes or so. I guess that helps with releasing the, um, the gases out of there. And some of the benefits, again, they're nutrient-rich with vitamins and minerals. We have sprouted breads. I mean, I can't tolerate regular whole wheat, whatnot breads, um, but I actually can tolerate, digestive-wise, the sprouted breads. They do very well in my system, and, and a lot of people do better with sprouting, too. Um, most specifically, vitamins A, B, C, E, and K. And sprouts increase in nutritional content as they grow. For example, vitamin C content in peas increases eightfold in four days compared to dry peas, and Bs increase sixfold, and vitamin E threefold in sprouted wheat in four days of sprouting. Um, so simply from soaking, sprouts provide live enzymes that assist with digestion and easier assimilation in the body. So that's why some people that have digestive issues do better with going towards raw and sprouting and juicing and whatnot. Um, sunflower sprouts represent a complete protein. Uh, they have a lot of chlorophyll as well as vitamin D. And pea sprouts come in just behind the sunflower sprouts with overall nutrition. They contain a significant amount of lecithin, which helps to emulsify, break down fat, helps with lowering cholesterol as well, um, and an excellent source of chlorophyll and protein as well. So there's all these different methods, and I think I'm pretty sure Deborah is going to get into more of this. I use this wonderful book here. We have there's a lot of them. This is called the Sprout Garden, um, and it, it got a lot more into the individuals of each. When you look at say broccoli, of the history and all the nutritional value, and how long you have to soak it and rinse it, and days and, and all that. And I didn't get into all that. I was just going to talk a little bit about some of the different methods. The jar method is the most popular one. Um, then there's the microgreen method, the bag method, the tray, towel, saucer, soil. Um, the jar method, basically they were saying that the, the mason jar was, was the best one to use. Um, you don't want to have anything that, um, is not, that is made of aluminum, metal that's prone to rusting, or, or the plastic. Most plastic. I wouldn't do plastic anyway. Um, so it's the most sanitary, quickest to rinse, and easiest to clean. And I believe that's what you use, right? Is the jar? That's what you did you say you did tray too? Or? Oh, okay. Someone else must have said that. Um, there's the microgreen method. Um, this basically, they were talking about using plastic containers and cutting it out and um, putting in the sprouts with the soil and then there, some roots are growing from that, and then after that, um, it's, I don't know, I couldn't quite understand this one completely, but they said it was best um, and ideal for broccoli, lettuce, and, and basil. There's also the bag method, which used either cotton, hemp, or linen, which is uh, also a flax fiber, and it's ideal for sprouting beans, particularly the larger beans like a pea or a soy. And they said precautions because it's easily bruised because with the, with the bag it's just kind of like you move it around and massage it and you could destroy and ruin some of the seeds. There's also the tray method, which is ideal for alfalfa, clover, and a lot of those uh, green leafies right here. I believe all we have out there is the jar. That's what I bought was, was that jar right there. 
And we do have some sprouts out there as well, some mixed seeds. There's a towel method too, um, where you would want to use an undyed white cotton. And the precautions on this one is to try to take them off and not ruin the sprouts. So they said you had to do some kind of uh, a nylon netting. Um, and also the bacteria and mold that would start um, to grow in, in that environment. And then there's the sausage, sausage, <laughs> saucer, which not really a saucer, but that's all I could find. Um, but they were talking about a terracotta bowl, and you kind of layered it um, and put the sprouts in between the two saucers, and they said this was best for psyllium, chia, and flax. And then there's also the soil methods, which this they say is more of an uh, advanced method. Um, kind of like where they were saying a, a child has outgrown its crib and it's starting to walk now. Well, this is this is sort of what they're saying is it's outgrown its containering. Now you have to put it into the soil. Um, so it owes its origins to the American Sproutarians Ann Wigmore, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard um, about Ann Wigmore. She's really big with the wheatgrass um, and the um, with this gentleman Victorious Colvin. Um, they co-founded the Hippocrates Health Institute, which that has a lot of great information on both their websites, and I cited those at the end. Um, sprouting by the soil method differs according to the seed or bean that you're using also. And you have to be careful with these, with any of the foodborne illnesses. You mostly have to worry about foodborne illness with more of your animal products, your dairies, your um, eggs and meats and whatnot. Uh, but they were talking about alfalfa, seems most prone to contamination because of they did this scarification on the um, seeds and that exposed more of the um, bacteria to get inside of the seeds and usually they're also eaten raw so they were saying that they're more prone to this than some of the other sprouts. So commercial sprout companies now what they do they sanitize their seeds and any treatment that destroys pathogens on the seeds also risks harming the seeds again this is we're trying to protect against these bacteria, but we want to have a good healthy amount of bacteria, which you walk that fine line between it. I was watching some movie recently and I saw the chickens um, in a commercial manufacturing plant and they were just thrown in this vat of the, the chlorine, which they just tumbled through to try to kill off the bacteria, which, um, you know, again, like I said, you're getting one benefit and the negative on the other side of it. So some of the methods of sanitizing include soaking in um, chlorine, bromine, hydrogen peroxide, or acetic acid like vinegars. Also exposing to ozone, UV light, or heat like pasteurization, and also irradiation. And that's been going on irradiation since World War, I don't know, it was back in the 60s or so. They've been doing that for the... Um, the military when they were shipping potatoes and they were trying to make sure that they didn't sprout and they've been doing it to the um, a lot of the different uh, spices and whatnot when they were shipping them back and forth so that's been going on unbeknownst to us for years and years and years and the FDA favors irradiation and approves of this chlorination uh, but the sprout industry is hoping for more of this hydrogen peroxide to be used so do we need to sanitize the seeds? Well, actually, if you have healthy, good amount of hydrochloric acid, that destroys most of the pathogens. Um, but they take precautions for infants, elders, and those that are immunocompromised. Um, they test for microbe contamination, and some suppliers test the seeds, the sprout seeds, to ensure absence of E. coli and salmonella. Um, illnesses have been traced to seeds from Africa, Asia, and Australia, so they say to purchase domestic seeds, store in clean, dry glass jars, thoroughly clean out your containers and dry them after every batch. Um, keep the sprouts in clean containers in the fridge chilled around 40 uh, degrees and rinse the, the stored sprouts before serving. So basically, there's a ton of benefits of why we would want to do fermenting and sprouting. And again, um, there's so many books out there and, and the different websites that I'll cite up there and Deborah's going to go into it more, but there's, there's just a lot of reasons why we should try to do a little bit more of this on our own uh, instead of just buying some of the commercial ones. So some of the good sites, sproutpeople.org has got a lot of good information on there. Um, another one I went to, sprouting.com, um, 
the annwigmore.org, there was a lot on there, as well as the Hippocrates Institute. Some of the references, this is more on the, um, the culturing of the foods that I use as a reference. A big one that I use is food and nutrition uh, that I got from actually one of the dietetic sites, as well as some others that are recommended on there. And books, the Sprouting book by Ann Wigmore, or I, I use the Sprout Garden by Mark Brownstein. So if anyone needs me to put those back up, I will in a minute. But um, so we want to, you know, do as much as we can on our own, and especially with what's going on out there, uh, with everything that's being done to our foods. If you've seen any of the food inks or food matters or any of those shows about what's being done, it really gets you thinking about trying to do more on your own. And I grew up with this on the farm. I had a huge garden the size of two or three times of this room. And my mom was always doing canning and cooking everything from scratch as much as possible. Um, we didn't slaughter our own cows, and thank God, I just couldn't bear that. Because I used to take care of the cows, and then if I had to actually eat one of them, <laughs> I took care of But we had our own milk, and we had chickens on the farm, and so we used all that stuff on our own. And now the trend is going back to that, being more self-sufficient as much as possible or going to your local CSAs or um, going to the farmer's market and, and getting things like that versus going the big farmer scale. Because now we're seeing that things are being stripped from the food supply because they're doing all these huge monocultures. And even now, and what I mean by the monocultures is um, fields and fields and fields of wheat and fields and fields and fields of soy and corn. And you see of cows and these huge farms that are pig and chicken farms, and they're constantly giving them low doses of antibiotics in their feed, which creates these superbugs that they can't kill off, which then, you know, us. So it's like the tumble-down effect from you got to look at what they're being fed, how they're being treated, and, and then what's, what we're consuming. So that's why a lot of people now are going more towards this, because you can um, take more control of your own health. Okay, so thank you for attending, and stay here because Deb's going to go through some of her uh, lovely recipes and go over this. And um, did anybody need me to put any of the sites up or anything before? Was it the websites or the the books? The websites? Sure. great recipes for um, sauerkraut out there that are wonderful and I, I made the kimchi and I tasted it this morning and it's very very salty so I can already see that with the next time I do that recipe I would probably alter it a little bit just play around with it a little bit and I think I think that if you follow the basics you know and I, I think that you have to pay this one I didn't do with anything but salt to, to do the fermentation so you know you have to just play around and experiment with it but if you follow the instructions uh, same with the sprouting if you rinse and and follow what they tell you to do. I haven't had any trouble yet. I haven't had anything go wrong yet. So it's, I, I mean, that's a question that probably Laurel can answer because I'm I come at it from more the food side of it, and you know my passion, my interest is in the recipes. But Laurel knows the the biology of it.
website called Raw Amazing. Raw, Raw, R A W Amazing. So, um, and it's just rawamazing.com, and they have wonderful recipes to, to make cheeses with, um, actually using probiotics in it, you know, the pill, the pill and, and that, I thought that website was fascinating. They had a lot of nice recipes. So, what I, I'm sorry? Raw amazing, like amazing, but raw amazing. So, the, what I, um, the two recipes that I did today, well, I tried to sprout lentils. This is the first time this has happened to me that nothing sprouted, so I did it twice and still nothing. And so, this is um, just to prove that this is as much art as it is science. So, I started, and it said that um, small lentils will sprout from 8 to 14 hours, and they've been about 24 hours, and I don't see any activity whatsoever on them, so I'm going to let them go a little longer. When you're sprouting, the most important thing is to, to remember is to always rinse and use clean water. You start out by with the dry beans, whatever you, whether it's mung beans or whatever, you always rinse the beans before you put them in the jar. Again, make sure the jar is sterilized and clean. And then um, every six to eight hours, I always rinse the water. You know, you can let them go overnight. First thing in the morning, rinse some fresh cold water in there, and you, you should be good to go. Um, some some um, recipes call for warm water. You just have to follow whatever the recipe is, whatever the bean is that you're doing. You follow what the instructions are, and you should be fine with that. So the two things that I made was I made a raw mung bean salad, which we'll sample later. And, um, and interestingly enough, they, we now have products in Nature Time that are already sprouted. So if you don't want to start from the very get-go with sprouting your mung beans, we have sprouted mung beans out there, and you soak them in warm water for 45 minutes or half an hour, something like that, and they're fine to use in salads, and you can eat them raw. So what I did, uh, the, um, the most time-consuming one that I did today was the kimchi, what I did for today is the kimchi. And as you can see, it's just um, shredded lettuce, I mean cabbage, excuse me, carrots, salt, uh, hot peppers, and uh, scallions. So that recipe I did. Um, lots of the recipes that I found online also had things like fish sauce. And but I, you know, as a nod to everybody that doesn't want to eat that kind of food, I just I just did a, a totally vegan one. And um, and so you shred everything up. Um, this um, this can actually be even shredded finer. This savoy cabbage because they didn't have napa cabbage when I went this morning. But I actually made that as a napa cabbage for the original recipe. And your handy little meat cleaver. And you literally, I thought that this was going to be impossible the first time I did, but you literally pound these vegetables down, and it takes a long, long time. But you, if you pound these vegetables down with a meat hammer, and some people have, there's also wooden cooking mallets that you can use, and you just keep at this until so eventually you're going to get so much liquid in the bottom of this because in, as you're manipulating this around, the salt is actually leaching the, the, the liquids from the, the vegetables. So the good exercises work well and naughty. You just mix it all in together. Wait. So it's salt, hot pepper. What, what was all the ingredients? This, I'm going to just read, read it off. It's daikon radish, spring onions, na napa cabbage, but you can also use savoy or any other cabbage. Um, and so freshly grated ginger, three cloves of garlic. That's this particular recipe that I'll give you. A half a teaspoon of dried chili flakes and one tablespoon and plus one teaspoon of salt. So that's the combination of things that I use in here. And probably you could talk and ask more questions because this is going to take me a long time. <laughs> well, it's, it, you'll want to do something that's going to get the job done. You can either use this or they suggested a, a wooden mallet, like a cooking mallet. It's, just, it's basically the same tool, only it's, only it's made of wood. And, and one thing that you'll really notice is as you're doing this, you will um, you will begin to smell the fragrance of the foods and how. I added no liquid to that, and I'll show you when I um when it gets done how much liquid is going to come. No, I did. I did the original one in the um, in in a uh, plastic bowl, but I just thought I would use this one because it was bigger. But it doesn't it doesn't pick up any flavor or anything like that. And this is just the part. I'm not going to store it or ferment it in this. I'm just using it to break it down. This one was for three days. Mm -hmm. And as I said, each recipe that you that you access online will tell you different things, different combinations, and there's a lot of um, 
latitude in what you want to what you want to use. You can use peppers. People put strips of peppers, radishes. It depends on what you want. I just stuck with a simple traditional kimchi. At home, I would use several. Things. You can use, um, well, cabbages is uh, the recipes. It's, yeah. The thing that I that I love about um, like taking the time to look at all these recipes and all these uh, processes is that you know we return back to where we you know to the original roots before all this technology and refrigeration and everything, and see that um, that our ancestors had and had a, almost like a biological instinct toward what was necessary and what they needed because you know sauerkraut and sprouting and fermenting and canning and all that. It, it increases the bioavailability of everything that's in the food, and now we don't have that anymore. So now we're going, we're taking the long route around to come back to where we began. So you know. It's about two weeks, I think. Yep. Hopefully it'll be so delicious it won't be there for two weeks. But I'm not going to do this until it's all done because I'll be here. Right. It took me a good. It took me about 45 minutes to do this. But if you if you come up, you'll just see the very beginnings of the moisture leaching out of this stuff, and I can see that the pieces are getting smaller. It's just beginning to start to get like a little bit of liquid. Not, not even liquid. It's just moist. But this will. So you can smell the garlic and you can smell, yeah, and these spring onions are pretty potent. Nope, nope. Yeah. Well, I mean, after, so what the method would be to get this to be where there's actually juice in the bottom and you'll see it. And I let it sit for um, about five or ten minutes and, and the salt continued to leach the juices out. And then you, you put it into the sprouting jar and then it said, I didn't have a wide enough thing to put the mallet in, wet enough um, neck on the, the jar, but so I just put a glove on my hand and you push the vegetables down and push it down and push it down until you get a little bit of water above the, I mean liquid above the vegetables, and then you just leave it. That's all there is to it. it it's like a condiment, on, it's a side condiment, it's almost, it's just like sauerkraut, only it's got a different flavor and spice to it. It's got, you know, it, and it's a Korean version of sauerkraut basically, so it's not eaten as a meal. Yeah. So you, so you, mm -hmm. oh, you mean you 
soak the carrots and the cabbage in that way. Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, I mean, it, you know, I, it probably it probably wasn't a, a, a straight 45 minutes because I was in the cafe and I was doing other things, but it just seemed like it took a long time. And it did, and it, and it took a little bit of muscle to get this down. But, I mean, it was an interesting recipe. And, you know, and I was shocked. I was shocked that that particular method actually yielded that much liquid. So, you know, but, it, but this, I, the reason I started out by saying when I tasted this is so salty, though. It's like I, that's why I would search for other methods because I don't like overly salty food. And this was really like, wow, this is really salty. Yep. Mm -hmm. Wow. So then, when you put when, so from that point, when you do it that way, what do you do? Ha, what do you do for the fermenting? Like, do you just put it in a jar after that? And, w and do you add liquid to it, or do you you just leave it in a jar and and it's just dried? Mm -hmm. Uh huh. That was one of the recipes I saw too. Yeah. Yeah. And so so does it, it continues to leach into the jar so that you're it's in liquid eventually? I mean, oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, that's interesting. I like that. I'm gonna try that that the next time. So anyway, this is one method, uh, time consuming. You want to exercise your right arm. This is a great way of doing things. And um, yeah, you, that's right. You can hold your hammer. You can do it. It says it said to put it in at room temperature in in not in not indirect sunlight. So not indirect sunlight. So you could. I I just left it in my office on the shelf, and it, I mean it seemed to do the trick. And it, it's just um, as I said, I was a little bit um. Well, not surprised because it was there was a lot of salt in it, but it's salt, very salty. But I'm going to let you guys taste it if you like. And so then the other thing that I did was I uh, the mung beans because my lentils didn't sprout. I I got the um, the already sprouted mung beans from uh, from the shelf at Nature Time, and I made a, uh, a Mediterranean style mung bean salad. And this was I mean if you're in a hurry and you don't want to take the time to um, to sprout the beans, this is a great way of getting all that benefit and and still using a sprouted bean. Yeah, so that's what I so that's what you to to just oh, just to start it out just to release them yeah yeah because the um the, the last demo that I did we sprout I did, I sprouted garbanzo beans and I and made the the hummus with it and that was delicious and they were very cooperative unlike the lentils I hate to say uh, and they just you know within days there was a little sprout and you, and you just let them sprout a little tiny bit and then you make the hummus out of that and it was like that was that was uh, chickpeas garbanzo beans yeah. You didn't cook them? Raw hummus, it was so delicious. Yeah, that's that's that was a really delicious recipe. So, and then the other foods, I, I brought in um, a thing of yogurt. So we'll do a little uh, taste test here, and we'll get you to taste what we've done today. Yeah, and uh, if, you, if you wait another five minutes, they will sprout. And then you get the added benefit of the of the added nutrients. And tell me about that. How do you do that? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. The whole, yeah. Well, I know that I, I know that my family. I'm half Greek and half Italian, and the Greeks used to soak walnuts and eat them that way too because of that. So, absolutely, <laughs> I, from both sides. No, I don't think it does. I think that it's just it, it's the spra I think the spreading releases. Just makes them more available. I believe that's how it. That I don't think we 
do. But you know, you, it would be if you go over to Bulk and ask Ryan, he would have the answer to that question. No, I didn't make the yogurt. <laughs> yeah, we can. Um, yes, we're right done at the end. You can sell chewing gum at the front desk <laughs> if anybody needs <laughs> their food. <laughs> After we do these demos. Yep. They use that. Fi they they use a lot of the f they use a lot of a fish sauce in, in there in some of the recipes. Not my favorite flavor either. 